You know, I, I just want to say as, a, as we conclude this series on uh, child, what we need to communicate to our children from the book of Proverbs, which is actually from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, that what we're talking about here is the ideal. Okay? Some of you have communicated to me about, you know, where, where is the hope in this? And I've taken that to heart, but it, it's, the hope is that parents will raise their children in the nurture and destruction of the Lord, and then we depend still on the grace of God for them to turn out right, don't we? Still a matter of if it really takes, or uh, if the child actually listens and responds and obeys. Because you can do all the right things, and things still don't turn out right for whatever reason. And uh, so what we're talking about here is the ideal. This is, what, this is the hope that we need to teach our children regardless of how they respond or how they end up turning out. And, and like I said, it's just by the grace of God they turn out to love and follow Him because He's the one that's got to change the heart and bring them along, right? You know, it's, we, do, we do what we do and we do try to do it right and we're not perfect and we're, we're flawed and, to begin with. So, but we still try to do what God says and when normally it turns out. So this morning, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs, which we've been using as a divine commentary on Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, which simply says, Fathers, train up your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Don't provoke them to anger by not doing that. And although we've been seeing that the New Testament doesn't directly have a lot to say about parenting, the book of Proverbs more than makes up for the lack. And so far we've looked at uh, four points, and we're going to look at six today, and I won't take the time to review the first four. I would encourage you to get the CD or to actually go to our new website where the sermons have been downloaded, and you can just listen to them on your computer, okay? Pastor Bob is not against electronics and all that stuff. He is just against the misuse of it, and we're going to talk about the misuse of other things today. So, so far we've looked at those four points, but... Last time we left off with the point that it's imperative that a parent, in particular a father, teaches sons and his daughters to control their bodily passions, in particular their sexual passions. And how important is this? How uh, big an issue is it? Well, it, it's the dominant theme of the first nine chapters of the book of, of Proverbs, and then some if you wanted to go through the entire book. It's an amazing thing. I just want to read you, they're, they're listed there, but I just want to read you a couple of these. Uh, one is chapter 2, verse 16. He's talking about wisdom and what will happen when a, when a child cries out for wisdom and wants to be God's person. And, and one of the things that will happen, it says uh, in verse 16, to deliver you from the strange woman. Or you could say the strange man, if you want to look at it from a daughter's point of view. But uh, that was usually the foreigner, that was in, in Israel when uh, prostitution was going on, usually it was a foreigner that would come into the land and could make a living no other way, so she would ply her trade there. And then, and then he says, from the adulteress who flatters with her words and leaves the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. And here he's talking about an Israeli woman who, in, the, in that culture they were... Uh, you know, you had Yenta, and she would uh, arrange marriages, and you get in this arranged marriage, and maybe the, the gal was unhappy in it, and uh, so she would go out and find uh, her fulfillment or something somewhere else. So she would break that covenant of marriage, and she would go find a lover. And he says, for her house sinks down to death. Remember how we've been seeing in here... There's so many things that deal with life and death in the book of Proverbs, either really experiencing true life, the, the life God has for us, or the death that Satan has for us as he presents all these things as an illusion and, and they look so attractive at the beginning and then comes the consequences. You know, a kid having a beer in a, a party and he's a little tipsy is kind of cute the first time. Fifteen years later, when he's a slobbering drunk, destroying his wife and his children and his family, it's not so cute anymore, is it? Same thing with sex. And here he uh, 
says it ends and it sinks down to death and her tracks lead to the dead. None who go to return, none who go to her return again, nor do they reach the paths of life. So again, it's a matter of life and death. Moral purity is a matter of life and death as we are presently experiencing in our own nation. Our country is going downhill so quick it it makes your head spin. And one of the primary reasons is moral debauchery. How does this process happen? Look at uh, Proverbs chapter 5. Actually, let's go to, I don't want to read that, it'll take too long, but let's go to chapter 7. Here's Solomon, he's sitting at his window. Maybe the big castle had big turrets on it, and he's checking out things. And He says, uh, for at the window of my house I looked out through my lattice, and I saw among the naive, or the simple, or you could say the stupid, I saw among the naive and discerned among the youth, A young man lacking sense, passing through the street near her corner, and he takes the way to her house in the twilight and the evening, in the middle of the night, and in the darkness. It's always in the darkness, isn't it? You know, I always think of that cryptic remark where Judas goes out and he says, and it was night. It's usually at night. And behold, a woman comes to meet him dressed as a harlot, cunning of heart. She is boisterous and rebellious. Her feet do not remain at home. She is now in the streets, now in the squares, and lurks at every street corner. So she seizes him and kisses him, and with a brazen face she says to him, I was due to offer peace offerings today, and I have paid my vows. In other words, I put in my religious duty. I made my sacrifice. I went to confession. I prayed. And now we can live the way we really want to live. I went to church last Sunday, and now it's Friday night though. Woo! She seizes him and kisses him with a brazen face. She says to him, I was due to offer peace offerings. Today I have paid my vows, therefore I have come out to meet you, to seek your presence earnestly. And I have found you, and I have spread my couch with coverings with colored linens of Egypt. I have sprinkled my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us drink our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with caresses. For my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. Obviously, this is the adulteress. He has taken a bag of money with him, and the full moon he will at the full moon he will come home again, and with many persuasions she entices him, with her flattering lips she seduces him. Suddenly he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter, or as one in fetters to the discipline of fools, until an arrow pierces through his liver. That's if you don't understand that, that means You can't live without a liver that's functioning. And having an arrow through it doesn't help. It says, uh, like a bird hastens to the snare, so he does not know that it will cost him his life. Now therefore, my sons, listen to me. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. For many are the victims she has cast down, and numerous are all her slain. Her house is the way to hell, descending to the chambers of death. Pretty much describes unfaithfulness and adultery and the naivete of people who think they're getting something for nothing. Now here we have a very vivid description of the foolish man and the foolish woman. You know, it takes two to be stupid, doesn't it? This is a man who thinks he's a player, who thinks he's got game, who has no understanding or discretion or moral compass. This is the man who just sees women as an object to fulfill his sexual lusts. He sees himself as the hunter, but little does he know in a spiritual sense he's the one being hunted. Because unbridled passion and sexual lust will ultimately destroy his life and the lives of those around him. His lust for sex and Perversion literally outweighs his desire to live, the book of Proverbs tells us. You know, one group that understands that is the pornography industry. Do you realize the pornography industry makes more than professional baseball, hockey, and basketball combined? Do you understand that? I mean, those are monstrous conglomerate 
money-making machines. Pornography outstrips them all when you add it all up. Why? Because man is just full of sexual perversion, man and woman. And they just cater to that monster within us, that sin within us. It literally destroys lives, and they understand that, and they would love to make a profit off you to destroy your life. Because it will destroy your life. It will destroy your marriage. It will destroy any relationship you have. It will just destroy you, ultimately. It says he's reduced to a loaf of bread in one passage. It says he takes fire in his chest. He's led like an ox to slaughter, like we read. Why? Because many are her victims and numerous are her slain because her house is the way to hell, descending to the chambers of death. Several times we're told this is a matter of life and death. Now, the same is true of the woman. Her life also is destroyed by unbridled sexual lust and passion to be an adulteress, to be a prostitute, to you know, be that way for free. Same thing. She too is hell-bound. She too has chosen the way of death. Proverbs 11.22 says, Of the indiscreet woman, like a ring of gold in a swine's snout, so is a beautiful woman without discretion. And, and in other words, she's out of place. You know, who would put a ring of gold in a swine's snout, right? I mean, it'd be dumb. You know, you put an iron ring or something in there, but you don't, you don't put a ring of gold as something they used to wear in the ancient culture. Like uh, Rebecca, when she met the uh, emissary of Abraham, they gave her a gold ring thing for her nose. I don't know quite how it worked, but, but that's what they did. And it was a wonderful thing that she was given. But she's, it's out of place in a swine's snout, because God has called her to be a virtuous woman, a wife, a mother, a godly example to her sons and daughters, one who is a model, an asset to her family and her community. That's the point. A ring of gold in a woman of discretion is a beautiful thing. Or gold earrings. But in a pig, it's something else. You know, Don was... (laughs) Talking about, you know, we raise pigs, we train children. Right? And I guess he got a lot of flack on, what was it, Facebook or something? Anyway, got a lot of flack on that. But, you know, you can raise a pig by just throwing them a few corn cobs and giving them some water and, you know, they raise. You don't raise a kid like that. You train a child. If you've got a good dog, you know what it means to train. You train them from day one to be the dog you want them to be or they'll help be a little monster. They literally be a monster. We train children from day one. We train them. We train them up in the discipline and nurture of the Lord. And that's, that's the point. Now, let's move on to a sixth point, which I believe completes what we've just talked about. Fathers and parents are to teach their children to love their mates. Look at Proverbs 5 and verse 15. I like this. He's, he's talking in a, again in a, the context is in a sexual context, and he's, he's saying, drink water from your own cistern. In other words, do it God's way. Should your springs be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets. In other words, don't, don't disperse your energy. Focus it on the one God has given you as a wife. He says, let them be yours alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth as a loving hind and a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. For why should you, my son, be exhilarated with an adulteress and embrace the bosom of a foreigner? For the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he watches all his paths. <laughs> You know what, folks? God invented sex. Isn't that amazing? You know, God, God invented it for our procreation of the human race, for pleasure, for enjoyment. And we're to be exhilarated in the love of what? Our spouse, our mate. 
We're to be exhilarated. That means excited, uh, blessed, thrilled, uh, enjoyment. You know, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, he tells us marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. It doesn't say he might judge them. It doesn't say he will not judge them. It says he will judge. There will be certain consequences to immoral behavior. You see, God's not against sex, though. He, he invented it. He created it. He made a man and a woman fit like a hand in a glove. But, and here's the rub in our perverted, oversexed society, overstimulated society, He blesses it only within the parameters of a marriage between one man and one woman for a lifetime. God's only standard is total fidelity within marriage, total abstinence outside of marriage. Something even supposed Christians today don't like to hear. Now again, remember, I'm talking about the ideal. I know people have been involved in all kinds of indiscretions before they're married, sometimes after they're married, and God has shown His grace in amazing ways. But what I'm talking about, we want to teach our children the ideal, not you know, second and third and whatever on down the line. We want to teach them the ideal. And what the ideal is, is total fidelity in marriage, total abstinence outside of marriage, But don't ever get the idea that God is down on sex. It's just the sinful perversion of it that is literally captivating our society that He hates. And it says He will judge. And we are are a society in the process of judgment. God gave them over. God gave them up. God gave them up to a depraved mind. Read Romans chapter 1, verses 18-32 through very carefully. And realize that we are in a society that is in the process of being abandoned by the grace of God. As a society. The church, the true church, isn't being abandoned at all. But we need to toe the line. And we're going to talk about standing firm in weeks to come. But God invented it. And He thinks it's great within the confines of marriage. So parents, love your spouse. Show appropriate affection openly and Teach your kids right and wrong. You know, I remember many times being in the kitchen giving Sandy a hug and, and you know, the kids would go, oh, gross, you know. But they'd really, they thrived on that. They loved that because they knew that their mom and dad loved one another. Don't try and teach them it's something that goes beyond closed doors and everything's, you know, kind of mysterious and dirty and whatever. Teach them that loving your mate is one of the most beautiful things that can ever be displayed. You know, I mean, appropriate. I said appropriate. Not like our inappropriate culture. You know, it's amazing how uh, that perversion is just going lower and lower and lower and lower to lower ages, isn't it? You know, like, Eight-year-olds are almost like mini adults these days, dressing like them. Used to be kids were like innocent until they're whatever. And consequently, all the different problems are getting lower and lower age levels because we no longer are having that innocence and kids are doing things that they just see on TV. You'd be amazed at the amount of kids that watch TV like late night shows. I mean, it's in the millions. And now they can get stuff on, you know, their computers or their iPhones or whatever, and almost indiscreetly. You know, and it's tragic what's happening. But we can show them true love, can't we, in our homes? Teach them God invented this intimate expression of our love solely for our marriage partner. Teach them to save themselves for that one that God will bring into their life. And teach them if they date somebody prior to that, that they would treat them as if that were somebody else's wife. You know, treat them pure and right and keep your hands off and keep your eyes focused on the Lord. That's what he's saying here. 
Teach them their mate as a gift from the Lord, as Proverbs 31.10 says, a godly wife, her worth is far above jewels. She's worth more than diamonds and rubies. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he'll have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. And she is his cheering section in the home. And it says he praises her in the gates as he sits among the elders of the land. Marvelous relationship. She is her husband's best friend and companion, and he loves and enjoys her alone. And the best way for us to teach that to our sons and daughters is enjoy your husband. <laughs> you know, enjoy your wife. And enjoy the, each other openly. You know, within reason. And display that kind of love before your children. Help, help them to see the beauty of marital love, not just bickering back and forth, and I want this, and I want that, and blah, 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 blah. You know, <laughs> get rid of that stuff. If you need to talk about that stuff, do that behind closed doors. You know? Talk things through. But display love and affection openly and discreetly before your children. So we need to teach our children to love their mates by loving each other. Then seventh, we need to teach our children to watch their words. Proverbs 4.24 says, Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put devious speech far from you. You see, we don't want our children growing up to be liars. As James chapter 3 says, we need to Help them tame the tongue. He says, for how great a force is set aflame by such a small fire. And there you see a kid or anybody who's a liar, and then they got to cover their lie with a lie, and then the two lies got to get covered with a third lie, and, and then all of a sudden there's another lie that's got to cover the fourth lie, and by the time you get to the fifth lie, you can't even remember what the lie was, and it almost sounds like truth. We've had presidents who kept lying and lying and lying and held to those lies, and then people started believing it. And if it's happening up there, it's happening in the home, right? Because if he can get away with it, why can't I? You know, and pretty soon it says, how great a force is set aflame by such a small fire. And that's the way it is. One lie leads to another, leads to another, leads to another, and then all of a sudden, bam, your life is just on fire. Or actually, you're going down in flames. Now, the only way that you can continually avoid lying is what? Tell the truth. Doesn't seem that hard, does it? You know, just say what's truthful. Tell the truth. You know, I remember one time our younger daughter, I won't mention her name, but... uh, (laughs) She came to us after a series of snafus, and uh, she goes, you don't trust me. You go, you're right. You've lied to us. What? Why should I trust you? You know, you've lied to me here, 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 and here, and now you're trying to get me to think you're telling me the truth. Well, maybe you are, and maybe you aren't. Let me check it out. I'll see if you're telling the truth. You know... <laughs> One time she told me the 101 Dalmatians was playing at the theater, so we let her go. And she went to see Surf, Surf's Up. No, 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 not Surf's Up. What was that movie with Keanu Reeves in it? Surf something or other. Anyway, it had some what? Point Break. Point Break, that's it. And uh, so we, uh, since we had been lied to before, we looked in the paper and... 101 Dalmatians is nowhere. (laughs) And the theater she went to was Surf's Up. Or uh, Point Break. Sorry, Point Break. Surf's Up is actually a cute movie about penguins. But, you know, I don't think I've ever seen Point Break, but it's... uh, I heard about it, you know, being a surfer, and, and, uh, you know, it was rated R and just a really nasty flick. And, you know... She came home and suffered the consequences. <laughs> but anyway, uh, 
You know, once you lie, you are guilty till proven innocent. Amen. Lie to, you know, lie to me once, shame on you. Lie to me twice, shame on me for not checking it out. That, that's just the way it is. And sorry, kids, if you know if you've already established that pattern, you're in trouble because you're going to have to work doubly hard at showing your parents that you're not a liar. Just the way it is. You know, Proverbs, uh, we need to teach our children to use their words wisely. Proverbs 10.11 says, The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. Again, the, the whole idea of life, but the mouth of the, uh, the wicked conceals violence. In other words, they, you don't hear the whole truth. They've got this scheme going that they're trying to lay on you and trying to get away with something, and it, and it ends in violence and death. And, uh, you know... Uh, it's a matter of life and death. Proverbs states that either it can be a fountain of life or a source of contention and violence, right? In verse 14 of chapter 10, he says, Wise men store up knowledge, but the mouth of the foolish ruin is at hand. You're just like one step away from stepping off the cliff. You know, when you're trying to walk that tightrope between truth and lying, it's always hard to remember what you said and who you said it to and when you said it. And, you know, we haven't got that great of memories, folks. But one, with th- one, one way you can just go, you know, somebody can say, well, you said this, and you can just go, no, I didn't, because I'd never say that because I don't lie. Very simple. You don't even have to have a memory. The older we get, the more we appreciate that. <laughs> you know, and, Verse 14, he says, Wise men store up knowledge, but the mouth of the foolish ruin is at hand. In verse 18, he says, He who conceals hatred has lying lips, and he who spreads slander is a fool. You see, our children need to be taught and disciplined not to lie, not to spread slander, not to uh, spread gossip, because the more they get away with it, the more they want to do it. We need to teach them Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 19. He says, when there are many words, transgression is unavoidable. Remember that. You know, there's another proverb that says, even when uh, the fool appears wise before he opens his mouth. Doesn't take anything. You just sit there and go, "Hmm, yeah, I better listen. You know, be quick to hear, slow to speak. James tells us, But he who restrains his lips is wise. The tongue of the righteous is as choice silver. The heart of the wicked is worth little. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of understanding. Teach them to weigh their words. And then to say words that are wise and actually contribute to the situation at hand. You see, the wise parent teaches his child to restrain his words. He teaches him that words are weighty, they are valuable like choice silver. And those words can be used in good ways to touch the hearts and lives of others. You know, I love Ephesians 4.29, which would be the counterpart of this, where it says, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, that it may minister grace to those who hear. We want the words coming out of our lips and the words coming out of our children's lips to be words of edification that build people up rather than tear things apart. Then eighth, we need to teach our children the value of hard work and then allow them the opportunity to work hard. Look at Proverbs 6.6. 6. And I don't know how many sons Solomon had, but I think he's describing one of them here at least. And he's giving him advice. He says, go to the ant, O sluggard. Don't you love that word? It just kind of rolls off your lips, sluggard. Observe her ways and be wise. Which having no chief officer or ruler, nobody lording it over them, prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provision in the harvest, How long will you lie down, O sluggard? (laughs) 
When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Your poverty will come in like a vagabond and your need like an armed man. He's talking about a man with a shield rushing into battle. and That's how your poverty will come in. Now here Solomon uses an amazing example, the ant. The ant, the ant is such a good example because... He works hard or she works hard. I don't know what ants are, but without supervision, without someone standing over him and telling him what to do, the ant can be trusted to be doing what he should be doing at any given time. Walk into the life of the ant, and the ant is doing what ants should do. Working hard at whatever he's doing. Right? Whether it's hauling that bug that's ten times bigger than him across your driveway. Have you ever seen that? I just stand there amazed. I don't even step on them when I see them do that. Because they, they're, just, they're just amazing. They're, they're, man, they, mu- they must be like Arnold Schwarzenegger. But anyway, they're doing what they ought to be doing. But not so the sluggard. His motto is, let someone else do it, but let me be the benefactor. Let someone else put forth the effort and... Just let me lay around and reap the benefits of others' labor. Another word for the sluggard is a leech later on in the book of Proverbs. Much like the attitude of those caught up in our welfare system, much like the attitude of many in large organizations, or even in churches. Let someone else do it, but uh, let me benefit from their labor. You know, entertain me. Keep the chips and the dips coming. You know, and let me just have my screen time. Let me just exercise my thumbs or something or... You know, that's what the slugger it is into. I met a guy the other day. He was looking at my uh, golf cart, and, and he was talking about family situation where nobody's working, there's two kids involved, young kids, real young kids, and they can't get them out of the basement from playing video games, the parents. <laughs> and the interesting thing is, he ends up separating from his wife over it. Because they can't present a united front that, hey, if you don't work, you don't eat. You know, develop a work ethic. Get out of there and start working your, in your 30s. Start doing it. So be warned. We need to teach our children how to work. Uh, But a wise father, a wise parent, drives that mental defect far from the mind and heart of his child. And instead he teaches them that, uh, like Proverbs 22-29, a man skilled in his work will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. In other words, he'll be a highly thought of, respected, recognized individual. He teaches in Proverbs 10, verses 4 and 5. I like this. He says, Poor is he who works with a negligent hand, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a son who acts wisely, but the one who sleeps in harvest is a son who acts shamefully. You know, he doesn't work when he ought to work. You know, as I think about my dad, and I've shared this before, the one thing he taught me was how to work hard. You know, I love my dad for that as I thought about it over the years, just... That was the one thing he did. He gave me man-sized jobs while I was still a kid. Not ones that were, you know, impossible, but ones that stretched me a little and made me work hard. And I, I carried that attitude over into athletics, very hard working in athletics. Carried that over into school, worked hard in school when I went to seminary and so on and so forth. You know, and that, I've carried that over into everything. You know, you work hard. You give it your best. You do your work. He taught me to, in a, in a way, he wasn't a Christian at the time, but he taught me to do my work heartily. And then I understood after he became a Christian that was as unto the Lord. I'm not doing my work for whoever. I'm doing my work for the Lord. Do what tries to please Him. And I do what I want, you know, what does please Him. And work hard at it. Now, a ninth point that goes right along with this is Uh, with hard work, is the need to teach our children to be wise in their use of money. The book of Proverbs talks a lot about the wise use of money because it plays such a big role in our lives. You know, we're we're not to focus on it and make it our God, but but, uh, we're to use it wisely. And most of us, 
you know, we'll spend a lifetime earning money, but many of us don't take the time and effort to manage it correctly. And thus it can become a great source of marital conflict, anxiety, heartache, and, and a poor example to our children. And it can really become an issue. You know, it's not that we make it our, our goal in life, but if we don't use it properly, then all of a sudden it becomes a big issue. And a lot of pastors have put into their ceremony until debt do you part, instead of until death do you part. And uh, because it has become such a big issue. But what does Proverbs say? Well, let me just share two verses with you from uh, chapter 3 and verses 9 and 10. One of my favorite portions of Scripture is Proverbs chapter 3, the first 12 verses. But in verses 9 and 10, he says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, and from the first of all your produce. What will be the result of that? So your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will overflow with new wine. Maybe put into a modern context, so your garage will be full of two cars, and your storage shed will overflow with all kinds of tools and stuff. I don't know. But uh, that's a truism, isn't it? Be generous with God and He will be generous with you. You know, it's very similar to Matthew 6.33 which says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. The, the things aren't the focus. God is the focus. Being generous with God and loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength is the focus. But the result is that God takes care of the other stuff. Food, clothing, shelter, length of life in Matthew chapter 6. And here you have the same thing. See, the principle is we need to teach our children to give God the best of their time, their talent, and their treasure. And we do that by both precept and by practice. Because if they see you giving the scraps, the leftovers of your time, your talent, and your treasure to God, then guess what? They'll probably do the same, right? Probably. They won't get it. Our actions will speak louder than our words. You know, I, I love Second Corinthians 9, 6, and 7, which says, sow sparingly and reap sparingly. And the picture is of a, a sower in the ancient days would have a big bag of seed at his side, and he would dip into the bag and he would cast his seed. Sowing sparingly would be the guy who reaches in there and grabs a couple of seeds and, you know, and then over here and then over here. And uh, come harvest time, he's got nothing. You know, he's got a couple little scrawny plants. But the man who takes his seed and casts it on the ground and, and you know, thousands and thousands, if not millions of seed go into that ground and he's got a harvest come harvest time. That's the way God expects us to be if he's to bless, just as you have purposed in your heart, he says, not grudgingly or under compulsion. You know, I remember the first time I ever gave $20 after I became a Christian. And that, that was a, like a sacrifice for me at the time. I was just clawing my way out of all kinds of debt and stupid things that I'd done. And uh, it was like I was pulling it out of this hand and then I'd pull it out of that hand before the offering plate. And, then, and it was like, I don't know if it was grudgingly or not, but it sure felt good to give it when I finally did. And, you know, since then I've learned the, the joy of giving, but uh, that first time, man, that, whoo, it was tough. But God loves a cheerful, hilarious giver. I discovered that in many ways. And still discovering that. God loves a person who willingly gives his time or talent or treasure in a hilarious, cheerful fashion. It's not like, oh man, do I have to do that again? Are you kidding me? Do they want more from me? I got it. Oh man, I can't do that. You know, not that kind of attitude, but one who's just like, wow, I get to do that. I get to teach again. I get to serve. I get to help. I get to you know, minister to that person, I get to go visit this person, I get to, you know, that kind of attitude. Wow, what a privilege. You know, service is such, such a privilege because, you know, God really doesn't need you. But don't take that to heart as if He wants you to be selfish. 
But he wants you. He's privileged to use you. He's privileged to take what you give and multiply it 30, 60, and 100 fold. Then lastly, we need to teach our children to love their neighbors. Look at Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 27. He says, Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. You know, it's not like uh, be warmed and be fed and we'll see you later. No, if it's in your power to give it to them, give it to them if you have it and you, can, you have the power to give it. He says, do not say to your neighbor, go, go and come back and tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. You know, so you can get another day's interest. You know, a lot of companies operate like that too. You, you know, they're on this 60, 90 day plan and you get the money the 89th day. And why? Because they're getting all the interest up to that point and, and you're, you know, eating beans and, and bread you can scrounge just to stay alive waiting for them to pay you. And that's kind of the idea here. When you have a day laborer, you know, you pay him when you got the money that day at the end of the day because that guy needs that money probably that at the end of the day. He says, do not devise harm against your neighbor while he lives securely beside you. That's a terrible thing. You have a neighbor who's scheming on you to you know, do you evil and you think you're secure, right? Those are the most vulnerable kind of people. You know, because they think they're secure and they're not. Uh, do not contend with a man without cause. Sometimes there is a reason to be contentious, but without cause there isn't. If he has done you no harm, do not envy a man of violence and do not choose any of his ways. Now the message is clear. Love your neighbor. Don't withhold good from him when it's in your power to give it. Don't deceive him. Don't use him unfairly. Don't plan harm against him. Don't hate him. Don't contend with him. But love him. Because all the opposites of those things are, hey, you love your neighbor. You know, that's the second commandment. You know, the second is says the first, love your neighbor as yourself. Treat him the same way you want to treat yourself. And be there for his benefit and his good. Now, notice in these ten principles we've covered, basically the first and foremost commandments are in them to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And we've covered many things in between. And there are literally hundreds of other lessons we could teach ourselves and our children from the book of Proverbs, but I'm going to leave that with you. Take these things, read through the book of Proverbs, study it out, take them and Teach them to your kids. When you get grandkids, teach them to your grandkids when they're over. When it's in your power to do so. And just really take the initiative to teach our kids these things. Because they're not going to be taught that out in the world. The world's like, grab all the gusto for yourself. You're the most important thing. How's your self-esteem today? You know, so Can we make you any more selfish than you already are today? You know, we don't need to do that. We need to teach them to become selfless and loving and caring towards others. And that's the whole point. Let me end this series of messages with a summation from John MacArthur's little book, uh, Being a Dad Who Leads, which happened to be on sale in the table right to the left out the door for 11 bucks. Just put it in an envelope, put it in the offering, and designate what it is if you'd like one, which sort of reiterates everything. I've said it in a whole different way, but... This would reiterate it. And he gives the following analysis of of what is at stake here. What will happen if we fail to implant God's truth in the hearts of our children? He says this, and he's talking to dads, because the book is written to dads. He says, if you fail to teach your children to fear God, the devil will teach them to reject and hate God. If you fail to teach your children to guard their minds, the devil will gladly teach them to have an open mind toward what's in this world. If you fail to teach your children to obey you and their mother, the devil will teach them to rebel and break your hearts. If you fail to teach your children to select their companions carefully, the devil will gladly choose their companions for them. If you fail to teach your children to control their bodies, the devil will teach them to give their bodies over to lust. If you fail to teach your children to enjoy 
the marriage partner given to them by God, the devil will teach them how to destroy their marriage through unfaithfulness and adultery. If you fail to teach your children to watch their words, the devil will fill their mouths with gossip, slander, lies, and foul language. If you fail to teach your children to work hard, the devil will teach them to be lazy, which will impoverish them. If you fail to teach your children how to manage their money properly, the devil will teach them to spend it carelessly and go into debt. If you fail to teach your children to love their neighbors, the devil will gladly teach them to love only themselves. You know, we said a lot of things, and, and as I said, you know, this is the ideal. In most of our cases, there's water under the bridge, and, but this is the hope. This is what we want to see ideally. How you go about dealing with problems and, and uh, departures from what we're talking about is still finds the answer in God's Word. But it seems there's always a lot more grace and mercy and that has to abound in that situation and, and rebuilding of trust, rebuilding of relationship, all, you know, just all kinds of things. Once they get damaged, they have to be repaired, right? It's like getting a cut on your arm. It doesn't immediately go away. You know, you've got to put the junk on it and tape it and bandage it and sometimes you can't use it for a while and, and you know, it takes time to repair things. So this is the ideal. This is what you want to start from day one. You know, with little Audrey Ann, you want to start from day one teaching her these things. And then as you start dealing with life, as it comes and rolls over you, <laughs> basically, you have to put God to the test. You've got to stick to your guns. You've got to stand firm. You've got to keep living the truth, expounding the truth, and let God give God the time to work. It's not like a soap opera where, you know, within a half hour, every family problem they ever had is solved. That, that's not real life. That doesn't happen. You know, everybody gets emotional. <laughs> Everything's okay. No. It takes time to repair relationships oftentimes. It takes time to see people change their life and head in another direction. It's a lot of work, and it's a lot of effort. And... But it's something we're called to, isn't it? We're called to be those who love and comfort, encourage one another, and who stand in the gap, and who are willing to teach, admonish one another with all wisdom. Like it talks about in uh, Colossians chapter 3. And that's really what the Spirit-filled life is all about, isn't it? It's taking the ideal and applying it to that which is not ideal, to the sinful, wretched world we live in, and then continually trusting God for the results and continually trusting and praying that God is at work in that person or that situation's uh, life. So, don't grow weary in well-doing, Galatians 6 says. He says, for in due time, if you don't grow weary, you will reap. So don't give up on people. Don't write them off. Don't expect change to come just so fast, you know, like a half hour later, everything's fixed. It's not the way life works. But be hopeful. Continue to apply the Word of God to the situation. Continue to be the person you need to be in the situation. Continue to teach the principles you need to teach and stand firm and be loving. Be hard and loving at the same time. It's a beautiful combination. <laughs> so let's pray.